In my house, I'm in charge of teaching the kids math. <laughs> yep, we've been homeschooling since before you were forced to homeschool because of a global pandemic. So, what do I like about teaching math? Well, I really like math. I like the idea of multiplying big numbers and adding and kind of getting with a pencil and paper and working through all the great math. Well, one of the cool things about teaching the kids math has been that their curriculum involves some amount of data visualization. And so while they are doing things like plotting things in a Cartesian coordinate system, they're also doing things like bar plots, which aren't ideal, but not too offensive. Uh, this past year, I taught my 14 year old how to make box and whisker plots, which was pretty cool. Uh, they used the range rather than one and a half times the intercortile range, which we've talked about previously. But I had to teach my kids pie charts. So you know what? Today, I'm going to teach you how to make pie charts in R and really why you shouldn't make pie charts in R. In today's episode, I'm going to show you how to make pie charts in R, but before I show you how to make them, I'm going to show you the critique of pie charts and really why they aren't ideal. Because the lay audience out there really loves pie charts, this filters back into science because we are part of that lay audience in many other disciplines than our own, say like microbiology for myself. Um, and so, you know, a lot of PIs will encourage uh, their trainees to make pie charts of their data. Uh, and so a lot of times people are kind of compelled to make a certain visual because either their boss or PI forces them to or because their audience is demanding it. Uh, in the microbiome literature, we used to see tons and tons of pie charts. Um, I think I once saw a, a graph or figure in a paper that maybe had 30 or 40 different pie charts. That is a little bit over the top. Pie charts aren't ideal. But like I was saying, there are ways that we can make them better. And I think that by studying pie charts and why pie charts aren't ideal, we can learn a lot more about making good visuals. We have created a stacked bar chart that I think is about the best stacked bar chart we could make. Um, this is a stacked bar chart showing three different disease status groups. So we have individuals who are healthy, people who have diarrhea and are C. difficile negative, and people who have diarrhea but are C. difficile positive. And so this then shows the relative abundance of the four most abundant phyla of bacteria found in the feces of these participants in the study. We also then have a group of other uh, that's pooling together more rare populations or rare phyla in these individuals. If we looked at all of the populations, all of the phyla across these three disease status groups, there'd be 13 different categories represented in the stacked bar chart, which is we've seen before just way too much. And so one of the big problems with the stacked bar chart is that you can have too many uh, different categories, too, different, too many different phyla or populations that you're measuring the relative abundance of. And because there's so many, it's difficult to discriminate between the different shades um, that are represented in your rectangles of your stacked bar chart. Another challenge of stacked bar charts is that oftentimes you don't have a common basis of comparison. As I have created this stacked bar chart in the previous episode, I put the most abundant phylum on the bottom and so that it has an anchor at the 0% um, percent relative abundance position on the y-axis. Then the second most abundant phylum, the Bacteroidetes, is at the top so that it is anchored at the top at the 100% line. And so then, at least for those two phyla, it's easy to make comparisons across the three different groups. The poor proteobacteria are kind of stuck in the middle and float wherever the proportions have them. And so it's a bit harder to differentiate the relative abundances of the proteobacteria in these three different groups. It's, it's difficult to make that comparison at the phylum level. If I were to go to a more fine scale level, like say the genus, it'd be even harder because there'd be so many more wedges and populations in here and there'd be so much more variation. Another challenge that we saw with stacked bar plots is that we don't know the end. We don't easily see the data to know how many individuals are represented here. Sure, I could put the numbers down along the labels on the x-axis, but that doesn't really give you a good sense of the data. The other challenge with stacked bar charts is that we don't get a sense of the variation in the data. Here we are representing the mean, the average relative abundance across a large number of, of subjects in the study, but I don't know how much variation there is. I don't know what the range is for these different phyla in the different disease status groups. Why am I going through all this? Well, believe it or not, a pie chart is the same thing as a stacked bar chart, but instead of having a linear y-axis, we actually have a curved 
y-axis. And so we will learn a new coordinate system today, which is chord polar, uh, which is in uh, ggplot mainly for demonstration purposes so that you can make pie charts. The documentation is very clear that you should not make pie charts. Go look at the help um, page for chord polar or do um, question mark pi in R and you will see great references on why you shouldn't make pie charts. The first pie chart that we will make in today's episode is a variation on what's actually called a donut plot where each ring, the concentric rings here, represents a different disease status group. And so you can imagine if we only had the outside, it would look like a donut, right? Homer Simpson would be very happy. In this depiction, again, we're only working with the five different groups, the four phyla and the pooled other. One of the nice things about this depiction uh, is that for comparing the three disease status groups, we have a common uh, axis or common anchor to make a comparison that's basically at 12 o'clock, if you imagine that this pie chart is the face of a clock. And so that is useful because then we can, again, compare uh, at least the Formicutes and Bacteroidetes across these three different disease status groups. And again, we kind of lose the proteobacteria in the mix after those two most abundant populations. And so I think this highlights, again, the challenge with stacked bar charts and pie charts is that they are really only effective, if you can say that, um, if you have a small number of wedges, like say two or three, um, because otherwise it gets too hard to compare across your different pie charts. One of the challenges with this depiction is that humans, uh, our perception is in terms of area first, not angle. And so if we look at this outer band, uh, even though the proportion is the same as say one of the inner bands, perhaps, um, the area is much larger for the same angle. And so that way then anything in that healthy ring on the outside is going to appear much more abundant than it really is because it's taking up more area um, in, in the plotting area, that there's more, there's more filled area, so to speak. So that's a real challenge with this type of visualization is that things on the outside automatically get more emphasis because they're taking up more area than they do proportionally to those inner circles. One of the other challenges with this depiction um, is that it's not immediately clear what these three circles refer to. And so here I have created um, labels kind of off to the left that are kind of aligned with the three rings to make it clear what they represent. The other type of pie chart that we'll make today is what you might think of as a simple pie chart without the concentric circles, without the donut plots. Uh, so you won't feel so hungry looking at these data. Anyway, the good things about these types of plots is that we are no longer scaled uh, by kind of position in the concentric circles, right? That, we, that everything is on the same size basis. I have a friend who once made pie charts where he varied the size of the pie depending on the number of bacteria in the community. And so I think he thought he was being cute. Uh, it was kind of cute, but again, perceptually, um, I think it, it becomes very confusing. In contrast to the concentric circle version, it's much clearer in this case what each of the three pies refers to, what disease status group they're coming from. Um, I created this plot being vertical so that, again, we could try to emphasize along that kind of 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock line a comparison point for the three different pie charts. If I were to lay this out horizontally, it would be much more difficult because I wouldn't have that common reference point um, kind of across the three uh, pies, unless I made that reference point kind of wrong, the, the nine o'clock to three o'clock axis on a clock face. So the goal for today's Code Club episode is to create these two pie chart visuals. Again, they are not ideal ways to represent the data. You talk to anybody about data visualization, and aside from perhaps the the idea that the flag of Japan is a pie chart indicating the percent of Japan that's in Japan. Pie charts really are, are quite flawed unless you're really going to a lay audience and you only have um, say two or three different groups at most that you're trying to, to represent within that pie chart. I think we can learn a lot about our tooling, learn a lot about R and ggplot by going through the process of trying to make these pie charts look as attractive as possible. Let's go ahead into our studio and we will take up the code that we generated in the last episode where we make those stacked bar charts that I was showing you. If you would like to get this code as well, please be sure to check the link down below for a blog post that's associated with today's episode where you can get the same code that I'm starting with. Also along the top here, you will find a link to a video that describes how I got everything installed, R, our studio, uh, the tidyverse package and uh, the data that we are working with here. Again, 
we load libraries, we load our data and data frames, we calculate the relative abundance and make the data tidy. Here we're pulling out the phylum level data. So if I wanted to make the same plot, but at the genus level, I could change this level equals phylum here on line 40. Uh, but here again, we are getting the average relative abundance for each phylum at, across the three different disease status groups. We then create a data frame to indicate which phyla should be pooled because their mean relative abundance across all three disease status groups is less than 3%. We then join all that together and make the plot. And here again, we have that stacked bar chart. Coming back to the code, I'm gonna change the name of the output file to be Schubert concentric pi dot tiff. I am going to add to my uh, ggplot pipeline, I'm gonna add chord polar. Uh, and chord polar uh, takes things from a Cartesian coordinate space, so basically linear, to a polar, where we have an angle uh, around a circle as well as a length. So our length is going to be associated with the x-axis and the angle or theta is gonna be associated with, with on the y-axis. So I will go ahead and do theta equals y in quotes. And I'm getting some error messages here uh, that I think is perhaps coming from some of the stuff in my theming, but I'm not totally sure. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run everything up to my chord polar and see if that works. And I will keep going until I get the error message. So that worked fine. Uh, so let me come down another line. Scale fill manual, that works fine. Scale X discrete, that works fine. Scale Y continuous, that works fine. My labs, labels, that's fine. Theme classic, that's fine. And then I think I'm down into theme and I think the problem is coming from the theme. So I will go ahead and comment this out. And again, that works. It's very ugly. And so we're gonna go about making it look better without all the error messages. So the first thing that I wanna do is I'm gonna turn those scale X discretes. I'm gonna turn this off for now so we can get something that's a little bit more attractive and easier to look at. I'm gonna label Y to be null. Um, again, Y is associated with the theta, the, the degree, the angle on the axis. Um, we also have here scale Y continuous. And so that's also being depicted around the perimeter of the pie chart. I don't need that. And so I'm gonna do uh, breaks equals null. And so we see we get rid of the numbers around the outside. And so that looks pretty good. I think what I'm gonna start to do now is to play with the theming because I definitely want my phylum names in the legend to be italicized. I don't want this axis. So let's come back and look at our theming. Um, and I'm gonna see if that's the problem, <laughs> uh, the first theme statement. So that's causing problems. Uh, so let's go ahead and leave that out for now and see if we can't get the legend um, stuff to work. So that runs without an error. And we also see now that we have our phyla names uh, being italicized and a little bit smaller key size so it doesn't take up so much space. I'm gonna go ahead and add some other things to my theme. Axis.line equals element blank. And so element blank means nothing. We see we then get rid of the axes. I'll also do axis tick. Ticks equals element blank. See we get rid of the ticks there. So that's looking pretty good. I'd next, again, want to come back and format those x-axis labels. Let's go ahead and uncomment this so that we, we have our labels in there for our um, x-axis or the, the rings. And we see that we've got our three groups. So I'm going to go ahead and add axis.text equals element markdown. And actually nothing happened. Um, and so I wonder if this should be .x or .y. Uh, sometimes the hierarchy of these axis text things don't quite work. So again, that gives us an error on X. I don't know if I give it a Y. So that didn't give an error. Um, I'm not totally sure why that worked, except that these are positioned on where the Y axis typically is. And so I think that that works pretty well. One thing that I'm noticing is that these are kind of shifted to the left, maybe a little bit further away from my plot than I'd like. Um, also, the font is a little bit big so that the text kind of runs together. So I will go ahead and do size equals eight. And we see that there's a little bit more separation now between uh, the three different labels, which is nice. So two things occur to me now looking at this. First of all, the labels seem a little bit too far to the left. There's a bit of a gap 
between the labels and the circle. Um, the other thing that occurs to me is that when we made the stacked bar chart, we went healthy, C diff negative, C diff positive. As I approach this visual visually, I start from the outside in. So I think I want healthy on the outside, negative in the middle, and positive on the inside. So we can change that very simply by coming back up to where we define disease stat as a factor here. And we had the levels where we laid out the order of the levels. And so I could go ahead and manually change this to make it case, diarrheal control, non-diarrheal control, and then we'll run everything. And now we see that we have healthy, diarrhea, C. diff neg, diarrhea, C. diff pause, and we're in good shape there. So now we wanna move everything back over to get it to be a little bit closer to the pie. I will go ahead and do um, margin as an argument to element markdown. And so margin equals margin. And I will say then R equals, um, and let me, so let's start with zero and I'll do units, a uh, unit equals lines. So that didn't really change anything. What if I do say like for minus four units? So that brings it a lot closer, right? But well, unfortunately it's overlapping with it. So let's make it minus one instead of minus four. And so then again, that brings it closer, but not on top of the pie. It's also making things right justified. Let's go ahead and make it left justified. So to do that, let me put these arguments on separate lines. I will then do H just equals zero. And so again, that makes everything left justified on those axis labels. If I want it to be centered, I could make it H just equals uh, 0 0.5. Let me go ahead and make those bold so that they kind of pop. I will do uh, face equals bold. And there we go. We now have bolded labels for our three different circles. The take home from this visual that I really want you to get is that a pie chart really is a stacked bar chart in a different coordinate system. It's in a polar rather than a Cartesian coordinate system. Also, the benefit, as I mentioned earlier, of the concentric circle layout is that we can have a common anchor point at kind of the 12 o'clock uh, line um, on our pie charts. The downside, however, is that this wedge uh, looks a lot bigger than it would be if it were in the middle or on the outside. Um, and, and that size, our brain thinks, has to do with abundance, and it doesn't. Uh, the abundance here is being depicted by the theta, the angle um, of that wedge. The next way of presenting a pie chart that I want to create is to have three pies for each of the three different disease status groups, and I'd like to have them arrayed vertically so that I can, I can do my best to have that common reference anchor point along that 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock uh, line. To create the three different pie charts, we're going to use the facet wrap function from ggplot. And facet wrap creates a different panel or facet for your data depending on the variable that you tell it to facet on. So we will do tilde um, disease stat, and then we'll do n row equals three. So we want three rows. I could also do n call equals three to put them on three columns. Uh, I want to make a vertical, so we will do three rows with one column. We will add the addition to that then. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and change my file to be concentric, from concentric to be vertical. And so what you see now um, is that we have our vertical array of our three pie charts and they are varying degree of donutness. <laughs> so the diarrheal control and non-diarrheal control are, are donuts. Um, and then this is like a Timbit or something like that. So the reason it's doing that, again, is because those concentric circles corresponded to the X aesthetic. So we need to fix that X aesthetic to make those pies the same size. We can again do that back up here, where instead of X equals disease stat, we'll do X equals one. And so we now see that we have our three equally sized pies, and they are again arrayed vertically so that we have that common anchor comparison point at kind of the 12 o'clock, six o'clock axis on our plot. We'd like to clean this up a little bit, right, by changing the labels on our facets. Um, the things are a little bit out of order because again, for making the concentric pie circles, uh, we, uh, we change the order. So I'm gonna go ahead and change that back and make sure then that our, our pie charts go from non-diarrheal control down to case. So that was back up here where I was defining the factor. So back up here, um, I now want this to be non-diarrheal control, diarrheal control, and case. I now need to change the labeling of these different facet panels. To fix those labels, I'm going to come back to facet wrap and add an argument labeler, 
and equal to the function labeler. And I then need to assign a named vector back to disease stat. And I will say disease stat equals pretty names. Uh, let's go ahead and put these on separate lines so they don't run off the edge of the screen for y'all. Uh, and so I need to create pretty names. Pretty names will be taking the information that I have down here in scale x discrete. So I don't need scale x discrete. I'm gonna go ahead and cut that out. I'll come back up here ahead of my inner join, paste that in, and I will then make uh, pretty labels. And this is gonna be a named vector where again, I have names that I can assign to each value of the vector. And I'll show you what that means here in a moment. So non-diarrheal control will equal healthy. Diarrheal control will equal this string. And then case will equal this string. And I can clean up the code a little bit. And then if I look at pretty labels, and say I were to do pretty labels, and in square braces and quotes, I then put non-diarrheal control, the output should then be healthy, right? And so that's what this labeler function does, is it returns the pretty uh, labeled, uh, pretty label for the facet. And now if we go ahead and run this, uh, and I see that I named it pretty names, not pretty labels. So let's go ahead and put this as pretty names. And so now what we see is that we have our pretty labels across the top. Unfortunately, we also have our X position on our pie chart. So I will go ahead and turn that off. And so I can do scale X continuous breaks equals null and add that in. Um, I can also go ahead and remove this axis text at Y because uh, we don't need that theming anymore. So that got rid of those X axis labels. The next thing I'd like to do is get rid of that rectangle around the facet label and go ahead and format that facet label uh, to be element markdown. So that is with strip background equals element blank. And that will get rid of the background and then strip dot text. I will then use element markdown Wonderful, we now have the formatting of our three different facet labels correct. I would actually like to move it to the left side because I feel like the labels are getting in the way and maybe is a little bit confusing. Does this label correspond to this pie or the pie above it? But I think if we have it to the left, it'll be more direct, clear what each pie refers to. Also then the pies could perhaps be a little bit closer and a little bit bigger. So that it's easier to see those wedges and to make the comparisons. To do that, back up here in facet wrap, we could also add strip.position, and I'll say left in quotes. And now we've got our label um, on the left, and it's at an angle. To get this to work, we're actually going to do strip.text.y.left. And so we're looking at the text on the, on the y-axis on the left, rather than the strip text itself, the strip text being the text above the plot. And so we now see that we've got our italics and our nice formatting. Unfortunately, I'm craning my neck to the left to get that to work. To get that label turned, I'll do angle equals zero. That looks really nice. Again, the pies are a little bit bigger and the names are off to the side. So it's they kind of get out of the way of allowing you to visually make a comparison across those three pies. Let's go ahead and make those labels bolded. I'll do face equals bold. So for pie charts, I think these look pretty good. I do kind of prefer this version of the pie chart to the concentric pie chart. That problem of the human eye trying to guesstimate, so to speak, the area rather than the angle, I think is a major shortcoming of the concentric uh, pie chart. Um, here again, we've done our best to line them up vertically so that we can overcome that problem of having an anchor point. Also working for us here is that we have so few phyla or taxonomic groupings that we are comparing across the three different disease statuses. Um, there's other things out there that people do to their poor pie charts is kind of tilt them on an angle uh, to make them have like this 3D appearance. That also causes all sorts of perceptional problems. Also then they make them explode or perhaps they have a wedge coming out at you. That also kind of triggers all sorts of perceptional challenges as well. Anyway, um, I do prefer the stacked bar charts to these pie charts, I think because it does give you more common basis points for comparison. 
Also, we do better at comparing area than angles, as I've already mentioned, and pie charts really are leaning on that angle and forcing you to make a comparison of the angle, um, whereas the pie chart or the, the bar chart forces you to look at the area. Anyway, like I said, we'll be seeing other ways in coming episodes that I think are superior to stacked bar charts and pie charts. Uh, but I think it's important to kind of see how do you build a pie chart? Because again, it forces you to learn a new muscle, this you know cord polar, as well as different ways that you can uh, take a substandard data visualization and, and make it better. What, can we get the most out of it? And I think we've done a pretty good job of getting the most out of these pie charts, whether it's the concentric or this vertical stacked pie, pie chart. So I'd really encourage us not to dismiss a visual out of hand. There are situations where it's necessary. Again, perhaps your audience or your, your boss is demanding it. I know that I am very quick uh, to bash different types of data visualizations. And I'm really glad that I that I, I took this on and making pie charts and took as a challenge of how can I make this look good? How can I make this uh, not look like a pile of crap, but make the pie charts actually look as best as I can make them. And so I, I would encourage you to do that with, you know, other types of data visualizations that you, you just personally don't like. How can you make them look the best that they can possibly look? Again, knowing that they'll have their limitations. I hope you play with the data and were able to download the data and work through it with me in parallel. If you want to learn about those other ways of visualizing relative abundance data, well, be sure that you're subscribed to the channel and you've clicked that bell icon so you know when those videos are released. Also, be sure to check out the materials that I have linked down below. There's a link to a set of materials for minimal R. And in that tutorial series, I go through a variety of ways of analyzing and visualizing microbiome data, whether it's you know, ordination to relative abundance data like this. It's also the basis of a three-day workshops that I teach. I teach these three-day workshops that you can register over at the Refimonis website. Uh, the applications for the minimal R workshop are microbiology uh, data and the other uh, general R is from non-microbiology data sets. And I think both of them are really powerful and have gotten really good feedback from people that they really liked it. Anyway, keep practicing with this material. Please be sure to tell your friends about what we're doing here in Code Club, and we'll see you next time for another episode.